it. Amen. Shall we say the Lord's Prayer, please? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much. Let me just allow some of the comrades to take their seats. Brothers and sisters, welcome and good evening. Deputy political leaders of the St. Lucia Labour Party, Honorable Alva Baptist and Honorable Sean Edward, former Prime Minister of St. Lucia, Parliamentary Representative of Viewfort South, Honorable Dr. Kenny D. Anthony, colleague parliamentarians, Senator Gibeon Ferdinand and other parliamentarians. Our esteemed guest speaker, who will be introduced to you shortly. Members of the Sir George F. L. Charles family, in particular our party treasurer, Brother Errol Charles and other family members. Vice Chairman of the St. Lucia Labour Party, Sister Alvina Reynolds. We also have with us former chairman of the St. Lucia Labour Party, Brother Claudius Francis, General Secretary of the St. Lucia Labour Party, Comrade Leo Clark, and other members of the executive of the St. Lucia Labour Party, members of the National Council of the St. Lucia Labour Party, chairpersons of auxiliary groups, specialized officers, Comrades and representatives of the trade union movement in St. Lucia, other invited guests, members of the media, one and all, I notice young people, I want to point them out in a very special way, one and all, good evening. My name is Moses Jabatis, and I am the chairman of the St. Lucia Labour Party also parliamentary representative for the constituency of Viewfort North. I wish to welcome you in a very special way to this function tonight. I want to tell you that the Sir George F. L. Charles Foundation was formed many years ago. Comrade Alva Baptist, the first deputy leader of our party, will tell you a little more in a while. But the Sir George F. L. Charles Foundation was formed to ensure that we are reminded of the roots of the St. Lucia Labour Party. The Sir George F. L. Charles Foundation was formed to ensure that the St. Lucia Labour Party kept to its ground, so to speak. The Sir George F. L. Charles Foundation was formed to remind us of the sacrifices of Sir George F. L. Charles to remind us of the sacrifices of his family and to remind us of what gave birth to the St. Lucia Labour Party. I wish to welcome you, especially the brothers and sisters of the trade union movement. I wish to welcome you to this lecture, a time of reflection, a time for us to, to sit down, have frank discussions, and a time to reflect on the impact of technology on the trade union movement, and I dare say, on politics and local organization within St. Lucia and other Caribbean countries. I wish to welcome you and say to you that the St. Lucia Labour Party wants to deepen its roots, not only deepen its roots, but, but to ensure that the streams and all of the aquifers 
that nurtured the St. Lucia Labour Party, that gave birth to the nourishment of the St. Lucia Labour Party, that we continue to deepen our roots and to strengthen our connections and our relationships among organizations and all people of St. Lucia. I wish to say to you that tonight is a time for us to relax. And I know Brother Abdullah has a lot to share with us. And I will spend, we will spend some time at the end of his discussion. We'll spend some time, uh, there will be some time for, for questions and an and, and exchange of views. So without further ado, I wish to call on the first deputy leader of the St. Lucia Labour Party, parliamentary representative for LABRI, Honorable Alva Baptist, to deliver some opening remarks and some reflections on the Sir George F.L. Charles Foundation. Let us welcome Brother Alva Baptist. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Although the protocol has been clearly established, I think it would be negligent of me if I did not extend a special welcome to family members of Sir George F. L. Charles, including our own treasurer, Mr. Errol Charles. I would like to, of course, before I navigate my brief remarks, to recognize my colleague parliamentarians, general secretary, executive and national council members of our great party. I see our former prime minister and former leader of the St. Lucia Labour Party, the Honorable Dr. Kenny D'Antoni. Our guest speaker, Mr. David Abdullah, president of the Movement for Social Justice of Trinidad and Tobago. Distinguished comrades, ladies and gentlemen, fellow countrymen and women, brothers and sisters. I join the chairman in welcoming you to the 2018 George F.L. Charles Annual Lecture. This annual lecture series is to pay homage to this great Viking, a former trade union leader, founding father of the St. Lucia Labour Party and chief minister of St. Lucia. He was the recipient of the St. Lucia Cross, and he was subsequently knighted by Queen Elizabeth II. Time and strict relevancy will not permit me to articulate all the benefits that we have derived from the hard work and, of course, sacrifice of Sir George Charles. But suffice it to say, the hard work and sacrifice of this patriotic son of the soil have given to St. Lucians much of the bread, justice, and freedom that we have enjoyed, especially the workers of this country. For example, every single piece of progressive legislation or actions in support of the working class in this country was undertaken by the St. Lucia Labour Party when in office or promoted by the St. Lucia Labour Party in opposition. And I will just give you a few of them. They include holiday with pay ordinance, contract of service act, Employee Occupational Health and Safety Act, Employment of Women, Young Persons, Chapter 100, National Health Insurance Act, Protection of Wages Act, Trade Unions and Trade Dispute Ordinance, Wage Regulation Order, Trade Union Recognition Bill, and of course, the Labor Code. This is why, in recognition of his invaluable contribution to nation building, as well as our strong trade union tradition, which is closely aligned to statehood in St. Lucia. The St. Lucia Labor Party felt it absolutely necessary to establish the George F. L. Charles Foundation for the following purposes. To undertake research, to document and disseminate information relating to the undertaking of the impact of political philosophy, economics, culture, and other influences on the development of St. Lucia. Two, to explore avenues for improving the development of the trade union movement in St. Lucia, and to provide a forum for the analysis of current world economic trends and the impact on the workforce. Three, to engage in activities and programs designed to improve the quality of life of working class people. And four, 
to influence decision makers in pursuing policies designed to achieve the maximum development of the human potential of St. Lucians, both at home and abroad. In fulfillment of those objectives, the Foundation has held a number of lectures over the years, especially in 2008, on a number of pertinent issues. Issues of interest to the workers, as well as the wider St. Lucian public. Today, certain developments in the world contain the seeds of our country's continued marginalization, with specific implications for trade unions and, of course, the workers of this country. For example, Daniel Tomlinson, a researcher at the Resolution Trust, argues that, and I quote, over the long sweep of history, it's clear that one of the big drivers of increased prosperity has been technological change. It has helped make our work more productive and our lives more enjoyable. But over recent years, it looks like technology is being used in another way to push risk in the workplace away from business and onto the workers. In view of this fact, the SLP believes that as a party that was conceived and born in trade unionism, that we must give careful and sensible treatment to this very serious issue facing workers and, of course, our trade unions. It is in this spirit that we invited Mr. David Abdullah to address us on the theme, the role and relevance of trade unions in the age of technology. We have no doubt in our minds that given his trade union background and experience, as well as his strong commitment to social transformation and justice, that our party of bread, justice, and freedom is convinced that it will handle this theme with the seriousness, competence, and confidence required to illuminate this issue, which will no doubt lead to a better understanding of the central issue. In addition, I am sure that this lecture will have the depth from which we can extract broad policy recommendations that can be distilled into specific policy recommendations as we prepare to enter into a new covenant with the workers of this country in our quest to get the politics right. We look forward to your presentation. And in closing, I would like to welcome everyone again to the 2018 Sir George F. L. Charles Lecture, which is being conducted under the theme, The Role and Relevance of Trade Unions in the Age of Technology. I thank you. Thank you very much, Comrade Alva Baptiste, who is Deputy Leader of the St. Lucia Labour Party and Parliamentary Representative for LABRI. Honorable Philip J. Pierre, who is the political leader of the St. Lucia Labour Party, will join us shortly. Honorable Philip J. Pierre is now with the Anglican Church. As you know, the Anglican Church has a very significant ceremony to this evening to recognize the, one, of the, one of the leaders who has joined the St. Lucian clergy. So Honorable Philip J. Pierre is with the clergy at this time and he will join us shortly. At this, stage, at this stage, I wish to call on Ms. Shemian Purpi to introduce our guest speaker to you. Let's welcome Ms. Purpi. Thank you, Chairman. Family and friends of Sir George Frederick Lawrence Charles, members of trade unions, Chairman of the St. Lucia Labour Party, Honorable Moses Musa Jabatis, MP for View Fort North, Deputy Leaders, Honorable Alva Baptiste and Honorable Sean Edwards, Parliamentarians, 
Former Prime Minister and Parliamentary Rep for Viewford North, Dr. K Sorry, Viewford South. Maybe I just wish Mr. Jobanti would one day become, I'm sorry. Former Prime Minister and Parliamentary Rep for Viewford South, Dr. Kenny D'Antoni, General Secretary, Comrade Leo Clark, members of National Council, members of the executive, heads of auxiliary groups, members and supporters of the St. Lucia Labour Party, invited guests, members of the media, good night brothers and sisters. My name is Shomian Popi. I am the secretary for the St. Lucia Labour Party Youth Organization. I feel honored to introduce our guest speaker for tonight. An economist by training, a labor and political activist committed to social transformation and justice. Starting from his days as a leader of the Students Guild at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, and throughout his almost 40 years as a leading member of the Oilfields Workers' Trade Union and the labor movement, David Abdullah has always been committed to improving the lives of the ordinary working men and women of his homeland and throughout the region. David has, David has been recognized for his leadership qualities. He was president of the St. Augustine Students Guild at 19 years old. He contested the parliamentary elections for the Tuna Puna seat for the United Labor Front. He then became the Oilfields Workers' Trade Union's Chief Education and Research Officer. He was the coordinator of the Committee for Labor Solidarity for his inception in 1981 and was elected the interim political leader of the party, which was formed out of that movement, the Movement for Social Transformation, Motion. Comrade Abdul has co-funded and has been centrally involved in very critical and civil so society organizations and movement, including the Constitution Reform Forum and the Assembly of Caribbean People, both of which are still active many years after the, their formation. David has always sought to bring diverse groups together in joint activity as evidenced by his leadership of the Federation of Independent Trade Unions and NGOs and such ad hoc bodies as the People's Democracy, the Committee of Media Democracy, and more recently, Citizens' Intervention. David has given of his time and energy to public service ranging from delivering lectures and speaking at schools, universities, seminars, and community meetings throughout Trinidad and Tobago and internationally, to chairing the board of the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies, and being on many cabinet appointed committees on the different administrations and his contributions as the Industrial Relationships Advisor of the West Indies Players Association. He is well known for the weekly newspaper columns that appeared for more than 10 years and as a popular radio talk show host. David Abdullah's contribution to social justice here and throughout the Caribbean has been recognized by his being awarded the OWTU's Labor Star and Cuba's Amistad Medal, one of that country's highest awards to non-nationals. Mr. Abdullah's vast experience, both in the trade union movements and the various public sector agencies, gives him a unique perspective on the changing role of technology within organizations, especially trade unions and, I dare say, political parties. His insights, I am sure, will enlighten us. Comrades, help me welcome from Trinidad and Tobago, Brother Comrade David Abdullah to address us.
Thank, thank you very much, Sister Shermin, for that very kind and elaborate introduction. I almost didn't recognize myself listening to that. Chair, and his absence, um, political leader, Brother Philip Peer, members of the executive of the St. Lucia Labour Party, former Prime Minister, Dr. Kenny Anthony, members of Parliament and Senators, Comrades, sisters and brothers, all members of the media, a very good evening to you. It is indeed an honor to have been invited by your political leader and members of your executive. It is my very distinct pleasure to deliver the George F. L. Charles Memorial Lecture organized by your party, the St. Lucia Labour Party, this evening in honor of your founder, Sir George F. L. Charles. And I want to congratulate the party on organizing the foundation because I do believe that political parties have a responsibility to organize foundations to carry out this kind of popular education work and so on. My own party had established a foundation but it's not as active as yours. So I want to congratulate you on this. And before I go any further, let me extend greetings of solidarity to your party from my own party, the Movement for Social Justice, MSJ, our Executive and Activist Council, which met just two days ago on Sunday, as they instructed me to communicate our very best wishes to you. Although the MSJ is a relatively new party, I myself, as you heard, through earlier political movements and my work in the Office Workers' Trade Union, have had a long and positive association with both the trade union movement here in St. Lucia and with your party, the SLP. And we always at the ODU organizing seminars regionally and conferences would invite members of the trade union movement here to join us in that process. Given that I am of a certain age, reminiscences become more and more frequent. This is actually, and a few of the older ones might remember, this is actually the second occasion on which I have addressed your party. It was in October 1987, almost 31 years ago, when Julian Hunt was your leader, and if my memory serves me right, Philip Peer was your treasurer, that I was invited to deliver the feature address at the SLP's annual conference. That year it was held in Labory, because one Neville Snack, and I'm not saying Lucian, so I'm bad talking anybody, <laughs> who I understand is now your governor general had just been elected a member of parliament for that constituency and crossed the floor immediately after the elections from the SLP to the UWP and was given a ministerial position. That shifted the balance of power in the parliament from 9-8 to 10-7 in the UWP's favor. Your party, of course, wanted to show that even though Snack had left the party, the members and supporters in Labory had not. So I was asked to speak. I don't know if I hit the right notes that day, but what I do know is that I don't speak Creole. My grandmother used to speak Creole, but not me. And that those who got the most applause in that conference that day were all Creole speakers. <laughs> the person assigned to take care of me during my brief stay was one Philip Peer. And this was a reciprocal responsibility because sometime before that, he stayed at my yard in Trinidad while attending a conference at the OWTU. It was therefore great to see him rise through the ranks of the SLP to be leader of the party and leader of the opposition. It's well deserved. <laughs> Comrade Kenny, I knew a bit earlier um, from the days when, just after the Grenadian Revolution, around that time he was at Cave Hill and my girlfriend at the time, who he knows, who is now my wife, before you all get <laughs> all kind of strange ideas and so on. And we, you know, streaming live on social media, you know, you have to be very careful about what you say. I was a student, and I came over from time to time on vacation to visit her. During one of those visits, Kenny either came over to her apartment or I went over to his, I don't recall. And we had a long discussion about politics and the state of the Caribbean. And I was told in those days, you see, at Cavill, that there was some tension between Trinidad and Tobago and St. Lucia. Not about trade, 
This was at Cavill. But about either TT men, Trini men, and St. Lucian women, or vice versa. In Kenny's case, it must have been vice versa because his wife is a good Trini. <laughs> I really was about, it really was, <laughs> anyways, let me go, go any further. And she's a brilliant one at that. And I know the Antoine sisters, myself from Trinidad, from my own days at UWE, and when they used to model for a very progressive artist by the name of Valerie Belgrave, who passed away a couple of years ago, sadly, who was a political activist, and who was one of the students who were jailed for the famous student protest against racism at the Sir George Williams University in Montreal in Canada. Valerie was an outstanding writer, artist, and painter who pioneered batik fabric and art in Trinidad in the early 70s. And Dr. Anthony's wife and her sisters used to model the batik for Valerie. So you see there are many connections in the small Caribbean space that we live in. Ernest Hilaire, who I don't see her yet this evening, one of your MPs and executive members, was a member of the Regional Executive Committee of the Assembly of Caribbean People, which was mentioned earlier. At that time, he was representing the Caribbean Federation of Youth. This is 1993, 94. He can't do that today. I was secretary of the ACP, and we were organizing the first assembly in Trinidad. And Ernest not only organized meetings for me here in St. Lucia to popularize the assembly, but also came to Trinidad regularly for executive meetings. Fortunately for him, I was not an active um, consultant for the West Indies Players Association when he was the chief executive officer of the West Indies Cricket Board because he would have gotten some good tongue lashing for me had I been on the other side negotiating. Chair, permit me one last memory. It was, I think, in May 1997. A group of the usual suspects of leftist and progressive activists were gathered for a weekend meeting at Bobby Clark's home in Barbados. Bobby Clark, very progressive um, attorney at law and political activist. Among those present were Tim Hector and Rosie Douglas, both now, of course, passed on to the ancestors. Rosie had flown into Barbados from, for the meeting from London. He had ended up campaigning for the British Labour Party and came back into Barbados loaded up with thousands of flyers and posters. Coincidentally, there was an election campaign taking place in St. Lucia. So as soon as our meeting finished, Rosie left Barbados and headed for St. Lucia with all the flyers and posters. He was adamant that the UK posters and flyers would be very useful in St. Lucia since they were in red and had the slogan, Vote Labour. I think that Rosie, who was just supposed to drop off the material, actually stayed and campaigned, I don't know if Dr. Andrew remember, campaigned for you and actually brought a newly elected member of parliament in, from London, from the UK, into St. Lucia. And I think she campaigned here as well, if I'm not mistaken. Suffice it to say that Rosie campaigned for three winning parties, Blair's Labour Party, one in the UK, Kenny's Labour Party, one in St. Lucia, and a couple of years after, Rosie's Labour Party, one in Dominica. This could only happen in our Caribbean. Now, Chair, let me turn to the matter at hand. I have a written address, but it's, that would take me too long, and I'm going to kind of summarize and, and, and break it down a little bit into things that we understand day to day. But I will leave the written, the written text so that you could read it afterwards and, and hopefully get some, some things for your policy development afterwards. You have indeed given me a challenging theme, the role and relevance of trade unions in the age of technology, and I trust that I can do it justice. To say that we are in the age of technology is an understatement. We are today living what was science fiction and comic book stuff when I was a child. I don't know if you remember Dick Tracy and Sam, the other sidekick. In, you know, police officers have a sidekick. In Trinidad and Tobago, we have an acting commissioner of police for about the last seven years. He's officially deputy commissioner of police and acting, so he can have a sidekick. He's his own sidekick. <laughs> but Dick Tracy, you remember he had a two-way wrist watch, TV, radio? Well, watches that are phones that can record and send real-time audio and video are reality today. Driverless cars, that too is a reality. And we will soon see flying cars. There are people who are experimenting now with flying cars. 
Information technology is indeed moving at an unbelievable rate of change. Apart from the obvious ones that we know and use every day, there are robots that can talk and do things that we only thought humans were capable of. Artificial intelligence has achieved that. George Orwell's book, 1984, and Big Brother, that knew every move you made on the street or in the privacy of your home, has been with us for some time as GPI positioning from your phone, your tweets and Facebook posts, which say where you are, what you're doing, what you're about to eat, where you're heading to, give us away. And the cameras and satellites of our country's security systems can track our every move and record all of our conversations, read all of our emails and text messages. And even if our phone is off, it can be remotely activated as a microphone to listen in on your conversations. In fact, as we are learning now, scientists can develop a very accurate psychosocial profile of us from analyzing the data obtained from what we like or comment on on Facebook. I want to warn you about that. That was happening in Trinidad in elections just the other day. Cambridge Analytica, you have been reading about it abroad. It was in Trinidad and so on. So when you like something or comment, they will go through that and then work out what kind of a person you are and so on. To the point where they could micro-target messages to you in order to win elections. So Rosie's flyers and posters that he brought down from London saying vote labor don't stand a chance in this technological era. But how did we get here? And what of the role and relevance of trade unions in this era? I'm going to try to address this in about four different parts. First, I want to identify the key elements of the revolution in technology that has been taking place. Secondly, I want to put that revolution in technology in the context of what is taking place in the global economy because technology is not neutral. It is how it is being used, in whose interest, who benefits, and so on. And the underlying economic structures and systems that we have is what is popularly known as neoliberal capitalism and globalization. Thirdly, I want to look at what the impacts of this revolution in technology and what the impacts of this process of globalization is having on societies in general and working people in particular. And then that, I hope, will say, uh, demonstrate what the case is for the relevance and importance of trade unions today. And lastly, I'll try to set out a few ideas about the role of trade unions today and my own concerns about whether or not the trade union movement is achieving what they're supposed to do. So let's begin. There are really about three major processes of, of revolutionary revolution in technology that have been taking place over the last 40 years or more. The microchip and computers, the science of new materials, and bio and genetic engineering. We know what microchip and computers have done. Smartphones, all kinds of communications that take place and, and, and that kind of thing that we use every day. What about the science of new materials? Many of you will remember the older ones, those of us who have gray hair will remember motor cars long time were literally old iron. The old Zephyr motor cars and Angler motor cars were literally old iron. Everything from bumper to dashboard, the engine block was cast iron and so on. Now these modern motor cars are alloys and plastic. If you hit it, they will sink in and so on. So what we have had is a revolution of materials that have changed what has been able to be produced and so on. Long time used to um, have telephone communication through copper wires. Now they use fiber optic cables and so on. And then if you look at bioengenetic engineering, we, those who engaged in farming and agriculture will know that you plant corn and then you take the corn, that you, some, you save some of the corn and you could use it to replant. But now you can't do that again because you have seedless corn, seedless tomatoes, seedless grapes and so on. So you have to keep going back to the companies that produce the seeds to get the seeds to be able to plant and so on. And I wouldn't go on further to say where that might go with biogenetic engineering. So this is what enabled all these revolutions and so on, enabled the reorganization of global 
production, which I call, which, which, which is known as globalization. So what happens is that with information technology, corporations, multinational companies can organize production on a global scale in ways that it couldn't before. So that if you're building a computer, making a computer, they could get the microchips made in Southeast Asia, where you have a lot of young women who are prepared to do that very fine work making microchips. And then they will press out the computer casing in the United States because you don't need a lot of labor to do that. You just need machines that, that print out um, the, the cases. And they will assemble it in Mexico using lab cheap labor in Mexico. And then they will ship it into the United States, put a label made in the USA, and then export it all over the world. They could do that because one person sitting down in the head office in the US can know exactly what is happening in all those factories all over the world, know what is the inventory, what is the stock, what is the demand, and so on, and link all of that through the computer. And of course, they could talk to the managers of all these plants using modern technology of Skype and Zoom and everything else. What that enables the companies to do is to maximize their profits by putting operations in different parts of the world that have the lowest cost of production. Then you have um, big companies, Adidas and Nike and so on, all these brand name companies making the products. So they're American companies, but they don't make the products in the United States. They make it where there's cheap labor in Bangladesh or Southeast Asia and, and China, even in Haiti and Pakistan and so on. And it is well known that the workers in those factories don't earn enough money to be able to buy the things that they make themselves. So this kind of production where you're moving goods all over the world means that the companies have to get all the restrictions and regulations and obstacles to trade removed. Long time in Trinidad and Tobago, we used to have a negative list. So you couldn't import a refrigerator, TV, a car from outside. You had to buy that from a local producer and so on. All of that has disappeared. You used to have high taxes. You come in, if you did bring in a fridge, you get a license and you bring it in, you have to pay 300% duty. All of that has gone and so on. Because they wanted to be able to move their goods all over the world, they had to get rid of regulations and restrictions on trade and they had to tell governments to bring down the taxes on goods that are imported and so on. And so we had this development of free trade as one key feature of globalization. And this has had a profound impact on labor, both directly and indirectly. So the revolution in technology has made certain kinds of workers redundant. Royal Bank in Trinidad and Tobago has been closing branches. And they will say, you don't need to go into the bank to do business. You could use the ATM or the ABM. You can do online banking, track your account, all kinds of things. So Tell us what are now called customer service representatives are no longer needed. You could send them home and so on. And then manufacturing um, is workers are being replaced by machines and robots and, and so on. And then the steel industry in the United States. I went and the auto industry, I went to Detroit many years ago in the 80s and the, the place was a semi-ghost town because the Ford company had a steel plant right in, the, in, in, in their car plant area and so on. But those things got closed down because it was cheaper to bring in steel from abroad. And so thousands of workers lost their jobs. And that is what Donald Trump was campaigning on. He's talking about bringing the jobs back to the United States. Can't bring the jobs back if the technology has destroyed the jobs. But it captured people's imagination and people voted for him because of that promise. But this has been happening in the Caribbean as well. The Office Workers Trade Union represents in Trinidad workers at Unilever and Nestle. And those companies, instead of manufacturing the products in Trinidad, are bringing them in from other parts of the world and so on. So workers in Trinidad now have been sent home. And not only that, instead of producing or manufacturing the products in Trinidad, they're becoming more of a warehouse operation to bring the goods in from outside, from cheaper um, labor sources. And then unions are told, well, it's your fault because the cost of labor is too high. So you have to bring down the cost of labor to be competitive with Dominican Republic or with somewhere other, some other country 
But then of course, if you try to bring down your cost, then the unions in Dominican Republic are told Trinidad has dropped their cost of labor, so you better drop yours. And what happens is that that drives down the, the cost of labor and wages are driven down, down, down in a never ending spiral. And of course, part of that is also union busting because collective agreements are seen as fixing terms and conditions of employment, wages, salaries, vacation, sick leave, all of these other benefits which have costs and those things must be gotten rid of because you are not being competitive if you have all of these, all of these costs and so on. And you have to be globally competitive uh, and, and that kind of thing. But there are other kinds of, of impacts as well. So that when you have free trade, governments no longer getting the amount of revenue from import duties and taxes. And that is particularly important in the islands of the Eastern Caribbean. In Trinidad and Tobago, import duties and taxes not so important because most of our taxes come from oil and, and, and so on. But here in the Eastern Caribbean, you rely a lot on import duties. So when, the, when you are told free trade, so you have to drop your import duties from 100% down to 15%, governments lose revenue. When governments lose revenue, then governments don't have the money to pay increased wages and salaries or maintain the levels of employment and, and so on. So another level, um, foreign goods can now come into our markets and so at, at a lower price because the duties have fallen. And so our local producers now find it difficult to compete with the foreign producers because our local producers are small scale and therefore their costs may be a little bit higher. Because if you're producing a thousand of something and somebody else is producing 10 of the same item, it becomes cheaper to produce a thousand than to produce 10. And so those big companies can sell into our markets at a lower price. And then what happens is that our own manufacturers and businesses start to run into trouble and they go out of business and workers lose their jobs, government loses revenue and so on. But when we try to export into their market, we run into trouble because those big countries will say, well, you have to label your thing if you're going into Europe in three languages, in English, in French, in Spanish and so on. So you have to pay a lot of money to the printer to print those new labels. And then they say, well, you have to pass our food and drugs regime and they will delay your application for months and months and months. But if they're selling into our market, we don't have strong regulatory bodies like standards bureaus and so on to be able to do the same to them. And so what happens is that, that we don't get the benefits of so-called free trade by selling our goods abroad, but they get the benefits by selling their goods into our market and, and so on. And then, um, of course, you know about free trade because of banana. I can't tell you more about that. You know what happened in the World Trade Organization when the United States went to challenge the European Union's importation of, of bananas um, into the EU on a preferential basis. But the U.S. didn't go because the U.S. was interested. It was about U.S. multinational companies, Dole and so on, that benefited. Who are the losers? The banana farmers of the Eastern Caribbean and, of course, governments that lost revenue and foreign exchange and so on. And then when governments run into financial difficulties, there is less money available for in entities for investment in entities that provide public goods and services, water, electricity, telecommunications, port, airport services, and so on. All these things require expenditure by government, but if government revenues have fallen because of all these things, the government doesn't have money to invest in those things. But citizens say, and quite correctly, people say you want better service, better price, more efficiency, and the government doesn't have the money to invest to give you that level of quality that you require. So then something else pops up. People start saying, well, if the government can't do it efficiently because they have no money, sell it, privatize. So privatization comes into the picture. And the calls for privatization are led by institutions like the IMF and the World Bank and others and so on. And then there are people in our own countries that pick up the call, some academics, but then you also have business interests, both foreign and local, who eyeing the prize 
Because if it is sold, somebody hovering like a Kobo waiting to get the thing for next to nothing and to be able to make money from that and so on. And then labor again is a loser because the private sector needs to make a profit. So if you have a water agency and so on, that doesn't have to make a profit necessarily because it wants to provide water for all. But the private company must make a profit. How do they make the profit? They have to increase prices or they have to cut costs. How do they cut costs? They send workers home, get rid of the union, get rid of the collective agreement, and so on. So you have privatization. And this is extended to other areas of state involvement that once were considered almost sacrosanct. Health sector, education, even public security and safety. There are more private security guards in Trinidad and Tobago than there are police officers. And people are talking about privatizing the prisons, which means, after all, that slavery has come back again because in prison it is forced labor without pay. And if inmates are doing things and producing goods for the private company to sell, there's profit in that as well. So all of this we hear under the mantra that governments are inefficient, that the state should only be the facilitator of economic development and so on, and the private sector must be the engine of growth and change. Now, I also want to say that there's also the policy, as part of all of this, this, this basket of policies, is that the market must determine the price, so that there must be no restrictions. Long time we used to have price control. So when budget time came around, you solicited the Minister of Finance to see if the price of butter and cheese and rice and flour and oil would go up. But of course, all of that has gone because there are no price controls again. So the market has set the price. In other words, the supply of the good and how much people are prepared to pay for the good will set the price. But the important thing for us to understand is that they also want to remove controls on the price of labor. And the collective agreement is the control on the price of labor. So they want the market to determine the price of labor, to determine your wage or your salary. What does that mean? If you have a thousand people who are unemployed, who could do the job of a hundred people, and the hundred people working for five thousand dollars a month, then the thousand people might be prepared to do that same job for three thousand dollars a month. And so if we get rid of collective bargaining and get rid of trade unions in countries where there is high unemployment, like most of the Caribbean, then what will happen is that the price of labor will be driven down by what is called market forces. Because the supply of people, the number of people looking for a work is more than the number of people who are employed. And people will say, as we hear often, half a loaf is better than none. But what that does, it means the half of a loaf that you're not getting, somebody else is actually getting and pocketing that and benefiting from that. So, all of these things are, are happening. And then, then they say, well, we must have competition. So, as I was mentioning years ago, you know, some sectors, you couldn't have foreign investors coming in. Now, all of that has been removed. So, you must have competition. But what happens with competition? You get the big chain operators, the big supermarkets coming in. And when the big supermarkets come in with their fancy um, marketing and all kinds of things like that, and everybody likes to go in the nice supermarket with the aisles with all the goods and so on, what happened to the small grocery by the corner and the parlor that Tanti used to run? Those things go through, right? And so people who were entrepreneurs, who are business people, end up now working for the big supermarkets because their businesses have gone. And that happens to pharmacies. We have big pharmacy chains in Trinidad now that are driving out the small drug stores and, and, and so on. So, and then there are investment rules that say that governments can't give preferential treatment to local businesses who are producing local goods and so on because that is unfair competition. 
So all of these things are features of globalization. Free trade, attacks on collective bargaining and union busting, privatization, deregulation or allowing the market to determine the price. All of these things are part of globalization. But there's one more feature I want to tell you about. And that is what um, some people call casino capitalism. Now, let me just ask a question. You all have Wei Wei in St. Lucia? You all don't know about Wei Wei? You have Scratch. You have Lotto. Right. But you don't have Play Wei. Like, we have Play Wei. You have, you have long time you used to have the, the numbers game, right? What do you call it? Different names. Right, no, okay, the, the numbers game is a thing that used to run illegal, right? I used to have fellas running with the numbers and so on. But in Trinidad, they, they, they have a legal one called Playway, right? So, in Playway, there's a, there's, there, you could work it out scientifically. It, it gives you $24 to one. So if you put a dollar and you win, you get $24. So if you mine a mark, so you put a dollar at the, tw now they have about four draws for the day, but um, long time was just two. So say you play 12 o'clock, and you put a dollar, and you don't win. And at 6 o'clock, 6.30, you put $2 for the same mark, you don't win. The next day, you put $3, and then $4, and so on. Whenever the mark plays, you actually will win money. But that depends on whether you can keep putting an extra dollar each time. You have to increase your bet each time. Now, you might think, well, this first time, fifth time I play, I'm only putting $5. But you really have put 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1. So you have to have a little bank to be able to mine the mark because the mark mightn't play for six weeks, by which time you have to put like $600, right? When the mark plays, if it if, if you put 600 and it plays, you're getting 600 by 24. So you're getting all your money back with a profit. But many people don't have a big enough bank to mine the mark all the time. So they will stop playing. And of course, a day after they stop playing, the mark busts. And they start to cry, oh God, if I would only... Right. So that is what happens now with the global financial sector. So you might see, if you look at CNN or Bloomberg or any of these things, you might see them talking about the price of oil, the exchange rate between the US dollar and the euro, the US dollar and the Japanese yen. You might see them talking about the price of wheat or corn or sugar and so on and so on. And the prices will go up and down and, and that kind of thing. So you have these investment bankers controlling hundreds of billions of dollars. And they are speculating, they're gambling on the price of these items. So if I am an investment banker and I have in my portfolio 50 billion US dollars, I am going to bet that the price of oil is going to go up tomorrow because of something with the Iran nuclear deal and Trump. So the price of oil is $65 today. I'm going to bet it will go up to $68 tomorrow. So if I buy oil at, at 65 and it goes up to 68, I sell at 68, I make a profit. Now if I, it's $3 per barrel profit, but if I have $50 billion, you can imagine how much profit I am making. And so they are bidding up prices of everything all over the world. And they're essentially gambling that the price will go up, but the price sometimes goes down and they lose hundreds of billions of dollars. And, and so, one of the reports that I picked up was that in 1980, the total of this finance capital in the world was $12 trillion. But by 2007, this had increased to $206 trillion. And in 2012, it was $225 trillion. I don't have today's figure. We're talking about trillion dollars, right? I can start to calculate how many zeros that is. That is in the international financial system, right? In the international financial system that a few guys control and are using that money to make money. Now, years ago, 
bankers used to make money by lending to companies to produce goods. So they want to expand a car factory or a food plant, as the case may be. So the bank will lend them the money, and then when the company makes more profit, it could repay the loan with interest, and the bank makes its profit that way. But that no longer is the model. They are using money to speculate in all of these things, in oil, in sugar, in, in wheat, in currencies, and all kinds of stuff, to speculate in order to try to make money. And so um, we even have a situation today where it is not even people who are deciding what to bet on. They now have artificial intelligence and what is known as algorithms which work it out which will say, if Trump tweets something tonight, the price of something is going to go up tomorrow. And so, buy that, and so on. So that is what is happening today. But when they lose, as happened in 2008, 2009, with the financial crisis, workers lose their jobs, businesses go bankrupt, people lose their homes, and so on. And we in the Caribbean were affected. Um, Prime Minister, then, Kenny Anthony would have known what happened when the tourism industry went into crisis after the global financial crisis because people up north were so scared about their future that they didn't want to travel. They, they said, whatever little money we have, we're not spending on travel. And so tourism declined. And then our relatives living abroad who used to send back money as remittances and so on through Western Union, they didn't have the money to send back. And so that money also stopped coming in at the rate it did and so on. So all of these things that I've described is what is known as the ideology of neoliberalism. And neoliberalism is capitalism in this era of technology. But there are some other elements of neoliberalism that I want to, to address. And the chair will tell me when I got to 30 minutes, and then I'll, I'll begin to wind down to, to my conclusion. Neoliberalism didn't drop from the sky. We could go back to the 1920s and for those who are interested in, in economic research and so on, I would recommend a book by the Canadian economist who worked with Lloyd Best on plantation economy, Professor Carrie Levitt, and she uses her maiden name now, Carrie Polani Levitt, who is 94, 95 years old. She called me yesterday morning in, from Montreal. She was in Trinidad the other day. She's very sprightly and so on. Her mind is very sharp. And she's written a very important book called From the Great Transformation to the Great Financialization, talking about her father, who was a very important economist, European economist in the 20s and 30s, talking about the debate in Austria and Europe in the 20s around the time of the great economic collapse of the 20s, the Wall Street collapse and so on. And the debate that was taking place between those who are proposing a socialist ideology and so on, and those who are proposing a liberal economic ideology of the market, the same thing that is being talked about today. And so, um, in, at that time, that economic crisis led in Europe to Hitler, to fascism, to racism, to xenophobia, and so on. And in response to that, United States, Western Europe leaders and so on, came up with what I call the post-World War II social settlement. They said, we can't have fascism, we can't have war, we can't have racism and xenophobia like that again. And so we have to ensure that there is no crisis in the economy which would leave millions of people unemployed, destitute, in poverty, hungry, and so on. Because when you have those conditions of people like that, they are prone to be mobilized by fanatics like Hitler. And I'm going to come back to that at the end. So this social settlement post-World War II said that we must have national governments regulating capital. No more free market thing. Because you let the capitalists give them an inch, they take a mile. So you have to keep them on the straight and narrow. Not that we're getting rid of them, but you have to keep them on the straight and narrow. That you have to control prices. Taxes would be progressive, so the wealthy would pay more taxes. 
And when the wealthy pay more taxes, the government will then have money to provide free education, health care, subsidized housing, subsidized transport, water, electricity, and so on. So that working people would have a chance at a better life because they have all of these opportunities and so on. That state enterprises would own and control the major goods and strategic industries. Trade unions would be encouraged to help to main, ensure fairer prices of labor, better wages and income, and to ensure um, industrial peace. And this, 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 this package was popularly known as the welfare state. Not that the state was going to be responsible for, the well, for giving out people welfare or the dole, but that the state had a responsibility for the welfare and well-being of every single citizen in that country. That was, the, that was the idea. And so here in the Caribbean, we had the same thing. Our labor leaders, and there's a very important book that was written by your own Arthur Lewis in 1939. He wasn't Sir Arthur Lewis at the time. He was in London, um, and he wrote a little pamphlet for the Fabian Society called Labor in the West Indies, the birth of the workers' movement, where he described all of the protests in the Caribbean with the West Indies and so on, and then talked about the demands that labor was making. So this is what he said. He said that the Labor Congress of West Indian Labor Leaders in November 38 in Trinidad called for federation, full elective control, but even more attention was devoted to the demands for adult suffrage, the dismemberment of plantations, the creation of a cooperative peasant community, nationalization of the sugar factories and public utilities, provision of old age pensions, health and unemployment insurance, and reformed industrial legislation. In other words, the same things that were, came out of the war in Europe, even before the war, our labor leaders were making those demands. And your own founder, Sir George F. L. Charles, would have himself been imbued with those ideas and fought for and won many of those gains for you here in, in, in St. Lucia. Then we move on now. Let me move on a little bit quickly. Um, so we move on to, to, to independence because we, we got a lot of those gains in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And it was labor that was out front to get those gains. And then we came to independence. And in the 70s, we went further. We said we must nationalize the commanding heights of the economy. So in Trinidad and Tobago, we had banks that were locally owned, some state owned. We had oil company and so on and so on, gas company and all of those things. And OPEC said we must get more for our basic product of oil and Michael Manley in Jamaica said we must get more for our bauxite and alumina and coffee producers and cocoa producers said the same thing. People were saying we want a new international economic order and so on. But this idea of allowing capital, big capital to control everything without regulation never disappeared. And so in the Reagan Thatcher era we saw a reversal of that whole Second World War settlement where there was supposed to be more equity and fairness and so on. And then we started hearing that because of technology and privatization and all these things that trade unions are finished, trade unions are dinosaurs. We are condemned to the dustbin of history and so on because workers Blue-collar workers are disappearing. You know, I have knowledge workers. Now, I find that disrespectful because a worker in a factory has knowledge. If they don't have knowledge, they can't work the plant and so on. And I know in, in, in the refinery and so on, if the workers there didn't know how those plants run, um, there are no amount of technology that you could get to run them because if they didn't know how much to crack a valve and all of that, the thing would have blown up. So... Um, we've been told we are dinosaurs. But there's some social impacts of neoliberalism as well. Individualism is something that we have to confront. So we have a new alphabet. A for apple, B for bat, and C for yourself. <laughs> C for yourself. So the whole notion that we are brothers and sisters, keeper of solidarity, the things that 
keep trade unions alive and so on, that build communities, those things are being broken down. People feel that they could negotiate with the boss man a better contract that the union can and, and, and all of that. And then we have the values coming out of, out of Hollywood and the United States and so on, what I call the gospel according to CNN. Yeah? And, and as if that is the only truth. And consumerism, if you don't have the latest brand, you know, the Samsung S9 something something just came out the other day. If you don't have that or the iPhone, what is it? Eight? Nine? Ten? If you don't have that, then somehow you're, you're not with it and so on, you know. But what another feature of this neoliberal globalization is the inequality in wealth. So, it takes four days for the CEO of one of the top five global fashion brands to earn what a Bangladeshi garment worker will earn in her lifetime. Four days, one man gets what a worker will get in her lifetime. Um, 82% of the wealth generated last year went to the richest 1% of the world population, while 3.7 billion people who make out the poorest half of the world saw no increase in their wealth. And I have a lot of data here, I'm not going to give it to you, just to say that in 2012, um, Warren Buffett, himself one of the world's richest men, was saying this, this inequality of wealth is not good because the wealthiest 400 Americans had an hourly wage of $97,000 in the United States. An hourly wage of $97,000, right? The 400 wealthiest, when the minimum wage in 2009 would have been about $5. See the gap? $97,000 versus $5. That is the kind of gap and inequality now and so on. We also have structural unemployment not only in our countries, but globally. The rise of contract and temporary labor, what the ILO calls precarious work or non-standard labor. Because when you have temporary workers, they don't get a pension. They don't get sick leave, vacation leave, all of those things like that, all of those other benefits. And the, the data is very clear that they earn between um, 30 and 60% less in developing countries and up to 30% less in developed countries of permanent workers and so on. And I have a lot of data and information about that. What is also happening is that trade union membership is declining. So in 1995, trade union membership of the labor force in the United States was 15%. Um, in Germany, 29%, UK, 32%, France, 9%. By 2013, it had fallen to 11% in the US, 18% in Germany, 25% in the UK, 7% in France, and it continues to fall. So trade union membership as a percentage of the labor force is declining because with temporary workers, they're scared to join a union and, and so on. They're very insecure. But we also then have migrant labor. So you see it on your television people in boats trying to get from North Africa into Europe, Syrian people escaping war, trying to get into Europe, and so on. But we, we know about migration. Your own, your own founder was a migrant worker. He went to Aruba to work in the oil company. Then he came back here and started the trade union here. We had the whole debate recently at the Commonwealth Heads of Government of the Windrush generation where our people went up and helped to build Britain after the war and so on and now being treated, treated um, like third class citizens and so on. But when you have migration in the context of people losing their jobs, of wages being driven down, what happens is that people begin to see the migrant worker as the enemy. In Trinidad that's happening now with Venezuelans coming in. So you, what ha then happens, you get racism and xenophobia. You heard Trump, the Latinos, the Mexicans coming to rape our women and do this, and the Muslims this, and so on and so on, and people of color. We have to get rid of all these people coming into our country. We have to make America great again, which really is make America white again. That was the message. So you get all of these fears being played upon, 
and and so you get you get the possibilities for crazy people to whip up emotions of ordinary working people who have real fears to be able to see somebody else as the enemy to see somebody else as the enemy and that is what happened in Germany and in Europe with fascism in the 1930s and what is happening again in the world today is we are seeing a rise of new fascism racism xenophobia as a result of the insecurity created by this new liberal global order and technology and things like migration so where are we going artificial intelligence i saw a program where artificial intelligence now is doing diagnosis of patients more accurately than your family doctor that's where it's going and very soon we'll do surgery on you because the robot's arm is steadier than the surgeon's arm architects could be replaced by computer designs and so on so even highly skilled professionals are faced with the impact of technology on their on their work and so on um data is valuable you could now shop not only online but they now have programs which you monitor your refrigerator and once things start to run out in your refrigerator it will automatically send a message to some company to restock your fridge and the delivery man will come and bring it to you <laughs> removing human contact of engaging in shopping and i know that is something that changes human relations because we no longer communicating and so on so the technology is is very real do unions have any relevance at all in such a world i see a very loud and strong yes i do so because all the underlying conditions the increased gap of wealth and income poverty youth unemployment structural unemployment the reduction of the quality of life as education healthcare housing social security are undermined that existed in the 30s when there was an explosion of trade union activity all those things are back with us today with a vengeance and so if unions were needed in the 30s when those things were happening they're needed today because they're happening today I firmly believe that the human spirit is one to fight against oppression and exploitation and for more and more freedom. The struggle may have its ups and its downs, but the trend is always in the right direction. So today trade union membership might be low, but there are signs of it being turned around. Workers in the US at Walmart and the fast food chains are demanding to be recognized in unions. They are calling for an increase in the minimum wage. Workers in France once strike just the other day. um against reforms of social security university professors in the UK were on strike about 2 weeks ago and some trade unions in the United States have joined and supported protests by the so-called DACA generation and of migrant workers so that the relevance of trade unions for me is not in question because workers are being exploited and so on the rich are getting richer at a very fast rate and the poor are getting poorer at a very fast rate Here in the Caribbean we have similar issues the protection of workers rights the fight for decent work ensuring that collective bargaining is respected and recognized tackling contract work advancing health and safety at work are no less relevant today than they were decades ago what we must ensure is that what we at may take for granted as struggles that have been won if we take that for granted we could lose those benefits because the the, the new liberal paradigm is challenging and reversing i want to 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 begin to end with another quote from your own saint lucian arthur lewis he said in the book labor in the west indies talking about the movement of the 30s the general aims of the movement are to raise the economic and cultural standards of the masses and to secure for them conditions of freedom and equality the attempt to raise the standard of living itself has two sides first the total income of the west indies must be considerably increased still needs to be increased and in the second place it must be more equitably distributed 
It is mainly on the development of this united labor movement that future progress in the West Indies depends. It has already behind it a history of great achievement in a short space of time. It will make of the West Indies of the future a country where the common man may lead a cultured life in freedom and prosperity. I want to suggest that those objectives, though partially achieved, have not been fully achieved. And so, but we have to go back as a trade union movement, back to the roots. And what are those roots? The 30s was not an agenda of the trade unions for just collective bargaining and the handling of grievances. And I say this to my trade union comrades in trade, and I was cussed by trade union officers in Oldfield, not literally cussed, but quarrel with them. I say, 40 years ago, the same grievances um, you are talking about today, I heard 40 years ago. So we have to, there's something that has to change because you can't keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect to get a different result um, because if you do, then you're mad. So in the agenda of the 30s was about the whole of the society. It was about every aspect of social and political and economic life. That is what the labor movement in the 30s was about. What kind of society do we wish to have? What kind of political democracy? What workers and human rights were to be given legal and constitutional strength? What kind of economic policies were to be introduced? How are we to deal with the technology? How will the increased wealth generated from the new technology be distributed? Who should own and control wealth and how should this be distributed? What are the power relations in the country, in society, between capital and labor, between men and women? That wasn't an issue in the 30s, but it is today. Between adults and children, between government and citizens, between the international agencies and governments, between the powers up north and small states in the Caribbean, all of these things, the question of the environment, climate change, all of these things are the issues that impact on everyone in the society. And the role of the trade unions is to articulate policies on all of these issues and to fight and defend the interests, not only of their members, but of working people and the poor on all these questions. Regrettably, in my view, I don't see the trade union movement, with few exceptions, doing that today in the Caribbean. Our movement is too caught up in just the industrial relations issues, grievances, collective bargaining, running to the Ministry of Labor, in Trinidad, going to the industrial court, and so on. The movement in the 20s to the 50s were the visionaries. Your founder was a visionary. He's a fine example of that. He didn't just fight for better wages for the workers. He fought to make St. Lucia a country where the common man may lead a cultured life in freedom and prosperity. That was his vision. He fought for that. That's why he fought for, for, for the right to vote, for self-government, and all those things, to be independent, to be able to stand up and say, we are people too. This is what our leaders and the movement need to be doing today, articulating a vision and program and policies to achieve that vision for a better society, a more equitable and just society. But I'm not the only one who's concerned about the labor movement. Rex Nettleford, the late Professor Rex Nettleford said, and I'm quoting, I have a deep concern that trade unions are being pushed further and further on the periphery of all social and economic arrangements throughout the Caribbean region for the convenience of the historical plantocracy the enduring commission agency class and the newly arrived technocracy. In other words, labor is being pushed by so, and the traditional elite are continuing to benefit from their wealth and their power. Lamming, George Lamming said, noted Caribbean writer and thinker, the last 60 years since 1938 must be regarded therefore as a period of transition. We have seen the gradual erosion of an old social order the political directorates have changed complexion, but they operate within the same basic institutions. There has been no great structural change in the patterns of ownership and control, and the new political directorates have never been a part of the old planter and merchant class. Now, I'm talking, Laming is writing this some years ago, eh? so he's not talking about St. Lucia today. Understand? Okay. You could decide how you want to interpret that. <laughs> they govern, but they do not rule. The transnational corporation assumed a novel dominance in all regional affairs. Domestic policy is determined by international lending agencies. Independence has not yet won the right to sovereignty. 
And then Laming quotes the historian Professor Elsie Govaya. Ever since the time of emancipation, we have been trying to combine opposite principles in our social system. But sooner or later, we will have to face the fact that we are courting defeat when we attempt to build a new heritage of freedom upon a structure of society which binds us all too closely to the old heritage of slavery. End of quote. And I'm ending there. We fought, those who labor fought, to bring us out of slavery, through indenture, and up to freedom. And the last major battles in that process were fought 80 years ago, 40, 50 years ago. But there is now another battle to be fought. What kind of society do we want to have? And if we want to have the kind of society that all of us as working people desire for ourselves and our children to live a better life, then we have to bring about once again a major transformation in the economic and political relations of power in our countries. We have to transform the institutions of state. In Trinidad and Tobago, I have said we have to move from the First Republic to the Second Republic because the First Republic of 1976 Constitution is the same old colonial institutions that are not working in the interest of ordinary people. Police system don't catch no criminal, white collar and drug traffickers. The parliament is, according to the Calpsonian years ago, in parliament, they kick sick. I talk about Trinidad and Tobago. Eh? In parliament, they kick sick. We have a chief justice. The less I say, say about that him and the justice system, the better. He didn't even know if he was entitled under his conditions of employment. A shop steward could have told him that. A first year shop steward could have told him that. That he could not go on accumulated vacation leave. So he wanted to go on six months accumulated vacation leave and then somebody said, hey chief, you, only, you can't accumulate vacation leave. And he's the chief justice. So, our institutions have collapsed. We do 25 murder cases in Trinidad a year. There are 500 people waiting for murder trials in Trinidad. So it takes 20 years to deal with all those murder trials. Not counting all the new murder cases that come forward. And the police only get before the courts 10% or less of everybody who commits a murder. So if all the people who committed a murder in Trinidad when, when waiting court, we'd have 5,000 people waiting murder trials. That will never finish. So our criminal justice system is broken. So we need, to, we need to transform all these institutions in the interests of the working people. And so the outcome of where we go will rest largely on the trade union movement as it is still the most and best organized of our civil society organizations of our social movements. There is therefore a crucial role for our trade unions in this age of technology. And I rest my case. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We will have 15 minutes of questions and discussion. But before that, I wish to recognize the presence of our political leader, Honorable Philip GPA, who has been here for a while. I suspect he didn't want to walk right through the discussion of Brother Abdullah. So let us welcome Brother Philip GPA, our political leader, to the head table. Thank you very much. We will spend 15 more minutes. You can simply raise your hand and um, I will allow Brother Abdullah to, to respond. Maybe, let me try this. Possibly we can do three, three questions and then we take three instead of a quest every single time we respond. I think that will help us a bit. Okay, so I recognize bro brother, um, brother Inch and also, I recognize the journalists. 
Okay, at the back. And uh, Brother Thebers, first three, then we go. Thank you very much. of time can we be um precise please um journalist jason sifley journalist jason sifley has the floor um okay hi my name is jason sifley i i have a question i wondered about since i was a young journalist it was that um you were saying the the trade union movement is part of the movement that goes from we go from slavery to a labor struggle which eventually turned out to uh turned into a political movement that had a lot of capital both economic and and political capital but it seemed to me that the the trade union movement was maintaining the dichotomy between workers and owners where in fact as a worker what i want to do is to become an owner so that i can live a life of leisure and not be a worker for the rest of my life do you understand what i'm saying what what did it, what were the the obstacles what are the factors that prevented the trade trade union movement from developing they developed political mechanisms and those were very successful so what prevented them from de- developing the kind of instruments that would have helped us to be the owners of the gas stations and supermarkets that are taking all of our money thank you well, one first round but the thebes last question in the first round just, just to bring back some memories brother abdullah <laughs> no 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 i actually actually it was pleasant tonight to hear you because 
Um, I serve in the Student Council during your time at, as chairman of C Hall. But more significantly, Chair, is the fact that the bad news tonight is that some years ago I actually printed and published a book on the history of the trade union movement together with Citon and, and um, Didikas. On, and this was sort of an autobiography of George F. L. Charles. And what happened is that, surprisingly, there are some copies around, but the main manuscript was lost in a fire at the FRC. And this is something that I want to link this up to the whole technology thing. Nowadays you have, um, it would have been good, if we, you know, in those days when I, when I owned the printry, I actually, you know the process, I had to shoot, cut and paste, and that sort of thing. Now, it would have been easy to just republish that. But um, um, we, we, we need to understand the value of the technology. And I, I think um, one of the things I need for you to perhaps address is the way forward with, with respect to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Comrade Abdullah will deal with those three issues brief, briefly, and we will take another three questions, please. Okay. Um, with respect to the, the second question um, on the issue of ownership, one of the movements that emerged simultaneously with the trade union movement in the Caribbean, and certainly I know about Trade and Tobago, is the credit union movement, the cooperative movement, which was and is a major um, financial institution holding a lot of resources. And one of the things that we're going to have to address is the role of credit unions um, in terms of using those savings of workers to invest in what I am calling, what has been called the social solidarity economy. In other words, we need to, and I, I didn't have time to, to, to identify the alternative policy set um, to, to neoliberalism, but which is what my challenge to the trade unions is that trade unions now have to think about what are the alternatives to the neoliberal agenda, which would include the strengthening of um, cooperative businesses, uh, ensuring that wealth and income can be created in communities, and, and so on and so on. Um, and the credit unions, I think, have a key role to play. From my own experience in the ODBTU, which has assets um, and had tried to run businesses, it, it actually is very difficult for a trade union to also run business because of the, just the demands of, of everyday work and so on. But I do think the credit unions are the ones that are best placed to do that. Now, with respect to the issue of, of the use of the technology um, and some of the other things that trade unions have to do, I, I didn't, yes, I, I, so I'm making a general point about the, the vision and the main strategic thrust of the, of the trade unions. But certainly, trade unions have to use the technology as well, as you are doing tonight, live streaming, right? Um, and, and a number of unions in Trinidad are, are, are live, do live streaming. I think this is also being picked up by my party and by the ODBTU and, and shared and, and, and so on as well. So um, we have to use the technology to reach the new workers, the young workers, who uh, a, a pamphlet and a flyer, they're not going to read, our young people don't read, but they will um, log on to Facebook and get messages that way, or they'll get emails and so on and so on. So we have to use the technology uh, to, to help to build and strengthen the movement and get our message across. There's no doubt about that. And um, unions that, for example, have to invest in organizing um, and in education, there are very few, very few unions in the Caribbean that have a budget for organizing and a budget for education. And that is it's critical to be able to unionize the new workers who are coming into the labor force to be able to address migrant workers, young workers, workers in service industries that are not easily unionized and, and, and so on. So there are many, many tasks that have to be done. Thank you. I recognize Mr. Calix George Jr. and then Ms. Um, journalist David Vitalis. Mr. David Vitalis. 
I think there's a mic at the back. Brief questions, please. Thank you. Uh, hello. Um, I think you might have already answered my question, actually, in the end. Um, but it's, it's very good to be here. And, of course, um, I remember Mr. Abdullah um, from UE days. He used to assist us when I was in the Guild. Uh, it was very much appreciated, um, the, the assistance. And I think he's also a fellow Milnerite, not a Sea Hauler like, like um, Teddy over there. Uh, I don't even know. Oh, good Lord. Well, you were always there anyways. But um, uh, this is my third... Um, public lecture that I've attended, and actually I must say that the crowd here is probably the best of all three. So I'm not sure if that's an indication of the strength of the party, um, or the brilliance, of course, of, of uh, Mr. Abdullah. But the first one was essentially about online learning. Uh, and the, the two major points of that is that education is now everywhere. And secondly, which ties into what you were saying, it, within th 12 years, by 2030, one in two jobs will be lost. And most of those jobs will be low-skill jobs. And so the question is, how do you bring people up? The second lecture I went to, the takeaway from that was about the brain drain, movement of people outside of St. Lucia, and how do you actually get them to connect, um, to bring them back into, um, and, and to make a contribution, even though they're outside. And I think you have already answered it, because you mentioned one thing which was very impactful, that whole thing about freedom, uh, the heritage of freedom, and the issue there, I think, is identity. A lot of times, we, we, uh, we, we go through this education of uh, bringing up people without an identity. So yes, they go through the academics and what have you, but they don't tie themselves to what, what is important in terms of their own heritage, their, their own culture, their own country. And so, essentially, I thought, what you, and what you already said, I think, was the issue of education, the role of the trade union, in doing more than just representing um, in terms of labor issues, in terms of the workplace, but realizing that even in the workplace now, people need to have a sense of identity. They need to realize that it's not just only about their job in the stricter sense. They have to be a broader citizen. They have to begin to um, play a bigger role um, in, in terms of, of public debate, public um, policy and what have you. So I think you probably have already answered it, but thank you very much and have a good night. Thank you, Mr. Calix George Jr. Um, journalist, Mr. David Vitalis. Yes, good night, Mr. Abdullah. The question is, do you think that an overemphasis on bread and butter issues, wage increases, might have been the undoing of the trade union movement. Um, and the background to that is I have seen in my experience of covering the labor movement in St. Lucia how this particular aspect of um, the movement ha has created a situation where the interest, I mean the physical interest of the workers were only present or most present during meetings dealing with wages and salaries. Um, and then the, 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 the other wider benefits, the fringe benefits, housing. I mean, you call a meeting to discuss you know, an aspect of the credit union growth or housing or, and the attendance is usually very disappointing. have to be you know, adjourned um, I don't know what the experience is in Trinidad. Uh, we have lost uh, at least five trade unions. Uh, two I know, you know, existing in name only. And over the years, I can count at least probably five that have all but disappeared. Thank you. Two questions. We don't have a third, so that's very nice. So I, I recognize... Um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Unesire and then journalist Jody Van Hall. Sorry, Van Hall. <laughs> and then we will take one more and bring the proceedings to the question into a close. So, Dr. Unesire, we'll take the third question and then we will come with Brother John in the second round, in the, in the last round. Dr. Hile. Thank you very much. Of course, comrades, it's nice to see you after so many years. 
and certainly a pleasure to have you here in St. Lucia. Alvin Toffler wrote this book called The Third Wave, and he was arguing that we were going through what he called the third wave of civilization. There was the agricultural, and everything that was organized from family society was based on agricultural modes. There was the industrial, where everything was organized based on industrial age understandings, and that we now go through the technological, where everything has to be organized according to the technological imperatives. And he made the point that all institutions that were forming in the industrial age are now becoming obsolete and disappearing. Mothers and fathers groups in our local context, youth groups, people don't go to meetings anymore. People don't want to do the traditional things that were industrial age. And isn't it therefore that the trade union has really become obsolete not necessarily in the representation of workers, because there will always be exploitation, which has to be represented, but the methodology and the, the practices and the way in which they approach the concerns and issues of workers are now totally obsolete. And in fact, the argument that what capitalism has done is to force the trade union to pacify its, its way of dealing with workers' issues. So you now go to industrial courts. You go to the labor commissioner to solve problems rather than striking and striking hard to hurt the, the, the oppressor. Uh, and that point being made that the problem with trade unions is that they've become obsolete just like all other industrial age organizations have become obsolete. So yes, there's a relevance, but it has to be using more text messages and flash mobs as a way of hitting back against op oppression rather than the traditional methodologies that have remained. What do you think? Okay, thank you. So. Um, after Comrade Abdullah, we will take the last round of three. Thank you. Okay, very interesting, and it's good to see you. I did mention you at the start of what I said, and, and the fact that um, you were part of the Caribbean Federation of Youth in the days of the Assembly of Caribbean People, but you can't represent youth anymore, right? Eh? <laughs> I see you agree like me. All right. Um, Okay, so I think the last two questions, well, the, the comment before, I, I think I don't need to respond to in the sense that, um, that um, Mr. George, I think, kind of answered what he was posing at the same time. But, but, but the observations, I, I, I agree with. The brain drain, of course, is a major, a major problem. And Lloyd Best once, once said, you know, that we were created as colonies for export, um, we're no longer exporting sugar, so what we are now doing is exporting people. Um, and and so, so the people who we spend a lot of money to educate and train are now working elsewhere. Um, some argue that there are benefits in that. I, I don't think so, and I do think the question of identity is very, very important. And, and that is linked to vision. And, and perhaps I didn't say it as clearly as I should have, but, but the, the, the leaders of... of yesteryear, the society knew that there were people of vision. They articulated something that all of us wanted to achieve. And we, we united behind them and, and so on. And they excited our imagination um, and, and so on. But in Trinidad and Tobago, if you were to ask 10 people, what is the vision for Trinidad and Tobago? You will get either none or 10 different answers. There is no vision. And so there is no national cohesion um, to, to achieve something. And that then feeds into the individualism where, you see me, I better just see about myself uh, uh, and, and so on. So the, the um, issue raised about trade union membership not being as active on issues outside of wages is true. It happens in Trinidad and Tobago. The best meetings you'll get when fellows get most agitated or people get most agitated is around wage negotiations. Um, and that is something that you, trade unions constantly have to fight against um, in terms of educating the members around what the issues are and so on. But it, it is not that the workers don't necessarily understand what is happening but it is whether they're prepared to take action over anything other than, than, than the bread and butter issues. But there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's another aspect of it, which is the media. I'm glad you raised it as a working media person. In Trinidad and Tobago, 
if the union has an activity to talk about an education program that the union is running, or the union makes a statement about some issue that is not controversial, media, zip, getting no headline. The minute they put a mic in front of a union leader and say, well, um, Mr. Abdullah, whoever, um, what is going to happen in relation to that negotiation? And the union leader said, well, if it breaks down, then one option is strike, which is simply the legal explanation. Headline, union leader threatens strike. <laughs> so one of the things that we have been up against historically is a hostile media, right? I'm talking in general terms, that wants to portray because the principal owners of the media in Trinidad and Tobago are big business that have an interest. And so, I'm speaking about Trinidad and Tobago, eh? and, so, and so there is a reinforcing of the perception of the trade unions as simply being troublemakers and agitators and people who are not interested in the public well-being when the history actually is the opposite. The other thing that I have to address is the education system. We, we can have children going through our schools not knowing who Tubali Rayabas Butler was in Trinidad and Tobago, not knowing about the contributions of labor to, to, to fight for self-government and the right to vote and all of those things like that and so on and so on and so on. And so children don't have a deep appreciation and knowledge of the trade union movement. Now, one could argue the trade unions have to do something to counter that, and I agree that we have to do something to counter that. But I think it also has to be addressed, and this is one of the things that, that Labour has to fight for, to ensure that the curriculum teaches us about our history and about our heroes and our heroines and all of that, to enable us to get a sense of pride and a sense of our identity. And, and so on. So that, that the education system is, uh, is a problem, the media is a problem. And the unions now have to use the technology in a way to try to counter that and to try to get our, our message out there. Now the issue of the, that, that um, Dr. Um, Hilaire raised, um, I, I hear you on the issue of this, the third wave, but what is very interesting is that there are new social movements that have arisen. And part of the problem, certainly in the north, and the, the reason why I'm pointing to the fact that the trade unions are, are failing in their role today to articulate on broad issues of concern to every citizen, is that in the United States, for example, you've seen the Black Lives Matter movement. You've seen the immigrant move, the DACA movement, and other movements, the anti-racist, um, xenophobia, um, the anti-fascist movements, you know, the, the, the um, what was it, the Occupy Wall Street movement and, and the Me Too movement, thanks. Now, these are powerful social movements and the unions are out of it, almost. In some cases, they're just on the edge, yes? Because the leadership of the union movements are the dinosaurs because the leaders of the union movements are not paying attention to the issues that are affecting citizens and workers and people in the society. So the, in the 30s and 40s and 50s in the Caribbean, our labor leaders spoke about every aspect of life. Education, health, housing, this, that, 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 every aspect of life. Um, and our labor leaders now, and I'm, I'm saying this as somebody who was in the movement, with few exceptions, don't speak about every aspect of, of lives of people. And so they're no longer the kind of, they've become a trade union movement in the narrow sense of the word around workplace issues rather than the labor movement of the 30s and 40s which were encompassing every aspect of people's lives. And so I think that the, the role is there, but the unions have to go back to the roots to say that we have to deal with every aspect of people's lives. Um, and so, for example, on every matter of national importance in Trinidad and Tobago, big debate about a judge ruling, correctly in my view, against the buggery law. 
So the trade unions have to speak to that. Trade unions have to speak about migrant workers, what's happening and so on, every aspect of people's lives. Um, crime and violence and so on and so on. And, and, and using the technology to be able to get those messages out. So that, that's my, my response to, to Dr. Dr. Hillier. Thank you very much. We, we are going to have the last round of questions. I have Mr. John. Do we have, and I noticed, ladies? Okay, so one, two, three. Dr. Virginia Poyot, Miss Wendy Jimson, and I have, I'll allow the gentleman, our last, the name please? Yes, ma. So, um, Mr. John, the floor is yours, Mr. John. Jody, sorry, sorry. Jody, not John, I'm sorry. That's Jody. Fine. That's fine, and the last name's Von Wall, like a wall. Like wall, okay, yeah. thank you, Von Wall, okay, thank you. Um, so my voice is kind of big, so I'm kind of not worried about the mic. Um, I want to go back to Mr. Seafley's point regarding the evolution of the trade unions into more um, worker and consumer cooperatives, but more targeted question of, are there any cooperatives within the Caribbean that have facilitated worker-led co-ops or consumer cooperatives? Or is that something that typically happens in South America or in Spain, looking at Argentina or the Mondragon region? Um, so are there any examples within the Caribbean where a credit union has gone past its glorified role as a savings and loans facility to actually help facilitate the creation of a worker-run cooperative? Thank you. Dr. Poyot, no. the floor is yours. Just one second. Oh, sorry. Dr. Poyot? No, I'm not Dr. Poyot. Okay. But the point I would like to make... And you need no, to no. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. It, it has to do with unity and the institution I worked before it was so strange that when the, cre the trade union came along it really changed how we looked at things and it really helped us a lot and it protected us the question is why it took so long it had a lot to do with victimization because the moment the trade union was mentioned immediately you were called to an office and you were being victimized and no one protected you so it had to do a lot with education, and that stigma is still attached right here in St. Lucia. And on the same point with unity, at one point you'll get people coming. The question is, when people come together, they speak highly about getting the trade union, etc., etc. And the moment they break away, they run back and they, they hide away from the, the true fact of, of it. So how do you get people unified? That's the question. Second... How are we supposed to be unified globally when, for example, Trinidad with their currency are not on the same page with us in the OECS? Because most jobs and labor actually go, now goes to Trinidad. And you'd find due to the low currency, especially certain institutions are now sending the labor to Trinidad and leaving us, well, pretty much our, our labor force our labor force is going down. I think you understand the question. So, on the same page of unity, how are we supposed to be a unified Caribbean in CARICOM going against the bigger countries like the United States, Europe, when here in the Caribbean we are fighting amongst ourselves? Now, that makes no sense to me. So, I don't know if you can answer that question. Okay, thank you very much. Very nice question. Let's move quickly. Um, Dr. Poyot, the floor is yours. Yes, I just want to add my voice to the discussion, and um, Mr. Abdullah. I just want to add the point that having been associated with trade unions almost all my life, one of the fundamental issues that I would want you to maybe agree or disagree, that I feel that um, the whole labor movement has been hijacked um, by dishonest and selfish individuals who mimic some dishonest political parties. And there is the element of lack of training and building secondary leadership in these organizations. 
and therefore workers have developed a lack of trust and confidence in the leadership and that has contributed to the demise of the trade union movement so i just want your views on these points that i have raised there thank you dr poet i recognize Miss um, Windy Jameson, youth. Good night, um, Mr. Abdullah. Um, my question is for um, I'm working in a shop in Viewport, and we have about five of us working in the shop. What does a trade union, and with your experience, what, what, um, how can we get the union to help us in getting a higher wage, um, a higher pay, our wage? or representation because when five persons people work at a place the boss can just send your man hire five other people with teachers police officers you have thousands that one but five people okay thank you very much um so our final question my brother yes um greetings everyone my name is osahiru maat of the white lotus temple first of all i want to Give praises to our fellow Trinidadians, George Padmore, Stokely Carmichael, CLR James, Eric Williams, and Henry Sylvester Williams, all the greats. I think the cause we are fighting is a just cause, and we must always call the name of our ancestors before we gather at these meetings so we can feel their spirits because. Our luta continues, the journey continues, the struggle continues with us. In this important topic we have here tonight, it seems that we are pushing against a storm that will overcome us if we don't change our concepts. There are things that have to change in our communities, and it begins at home. The brother Abdullah said that it turned from capitalism to racism to xenophobia. But I would say it started with xenophobia that turned to racism and it continues with capitalism and it will continue on and on. The, the real solution I think is in culture, in culture and education. We have to ground ourselves in the struggle again. What is happening in St. Lucia? A victimization and the selling of land cheap. This is, these are things that need to be spoken about. The, the trade unions, the credit unions, the trade unions, they are not obsolete. They are important now more than ever. Because of capitalism, we are at this point. Remember, we are the Christ that were crucified on the cross of capitalism. We cannot solve this problem with capitalism. We can solve this problem, as the brother said, with unity. We also, it is very important that we go down to that individuality we spoke about and the bigotry which goes, which goes right down to the core and essence of our being which is found in religion. So we need education. Education, I would say altruist, altruism. We need to go into the truth or else it will not work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, my brother. I now invite Brother Abdullah to respond briefly to the final round of comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, okay, to the um, brother who just spoke, I think the comment stands on its own. I don't think I need to, to respond. And thank you for remembering the, the ancestors, those who led the Pan-African movement globally um, coming out of Trinidad and Tobago. The, 
Sister from Viewfort, um, who raised the issue of the problems at the workplace, it's difficult for me to give a general response because I don't know the specific trade union laws in St. Lucia. In Trinidad and Tobago, it would be a very difficult situation because our process of trade union recognition is extremely convoluted and very bureaucratic. And we have, we have situations where we apply for recognition and it takes us four, five, 10, 15 years in some cases to get recognition because it has become so legalistic and so on. Um, the, the, the most important thing, however, comes back to the question of unity. Yes, there's always fear of victimization, and that is why the five of you, or four of you, have to be united um, to be able to go forward. But I would suggest that you talk with one of the persons from the trade unions here who can indicate the, how you go about um, joining the union or having the union represent you for collective bargaining purposes and so on. But it, the, the issue coming back to unity, which um, the brother at the back raised and so on. Unity obviously is very important and, and the sense of solidarity. And, and one of the problems that we have in this era of technology and globalization is everybody is fixated with you know, themselves. And it, 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 it starts from, from young. So in the household, um, and that happens in my household too, everybody on the phone are not talking with one another and some of them WhatsApping one another from one bedroom to the next instead of getting up off their bed and going and talking. It, it is as bad as that. Um, so so we, we, when that happens, or young children playing these video games, so instead of playing outdoors and learning social interaction and, and so on, you're playing video games um, and there's very little communication this way because everybody is communicating with the machine and so on. So, so all of that helps to break down the sense of community, the sense of solidarity and the sense of, of unity. And it, it therefore requires a great amount of effort by, by unions to, to educate workers on their, on their rights um, and, and many unions don't, don't engage in that process. Uh, and so on. My sense is that when workers do understand their rights, they're far more inclined to come forward, to come to a union for help, or to join a trade union, and so on. So I think the unions have a lot of work to do in terms of, of education. Um, in terms of the, the, the point the brother was raising, really has to do with the Caribbean single market and economy. And one of the problems of the CSME because, well, of course, this, I should say the single market because we don't have a single economy. Um, one of the problems of the Caribbean single market is the fact that there are inequalities within CARICOM in the same way that I was describing inequalities between the large countries up north and our small countries. There are inequalities. So, yes, I know that in many parts of the Caribbean, Trinidad and Tobago is seen as a very bad place because all of our manufactured goods, our biscuits and our sweet drink and our juices and our other things, ketchup and all those things, come into your, into your market um, and squeeze out St. Lucian producers and so on. Now, what we therefore have to do is to take it to another level to ensure that the regional integration process is one that ensures that no island or no country is going to be left out of economic development or marginalized as a result of, of the activity. Um, and and that, that's an, a, another discussion which we can't get into now. But, but if we had a single economy, we would have a single currency. And therefore, there would be no differentiation in in, in currency rates and, and therefore people couldn't you know, adjust their currency rate in order to get a competitive advantage and so on. So, so we do have to move that process forward and one of the sad things in my view is that we chased after the economic partnership agreement with the European Union rather than ensuring first that we put in place the second part of the CSME which was the Caribbean single economy. 
Um, but that, that's another discussion. Um, and the regional integration process has to begin at a people level, which is why we started in the 90s the Assembly of Caribbean People, because we can't only have regional integration and discussions around the problems of Caribbean people taking place at the level of government. So there's supposed to be a certain amount of free movement of people, but even that is problematic because you could get stopped at immigration and harassed and so on and so on, even when... and, and um, Oh, what's his name? Um, the journalist um, who's St. Lucian, Peter Richards, who lives in Trinidad and Tobago. And he's a journalist and therefore has, would have a Caribbean skills certificate. But quite apart from that, lives in Trinidad and Tobago, is married to a Trinidadian, has been living in Trinidad for a long time. But he works all throughout the region. But he always gives a story that when he lands in Trinidad, the immigration officer says, so what are you coming here for? And so on. And we could put you out. Well, his comment, I can't repeat here because this is a decent audience, but what he tells the, the immigration officer essentially is that he's going home to his wife, right? But he doesn't put it in such nice language, right? And, and, so, and so we haven't operated Caribbean integration properly, and we have to deal with it at a people-to-people -people level. Um, the, the, the point raised by, by Dr. Poyot, in my view, I, I can't say in general terms that the trade union movement has been hijacked by opportunists and corrupt people. I have no doubt that in some trade unions there are opportunists that, as in human nature, there are people who are seeking their own interests, some have become corrupt, and so on, some have lost their way. All of that can happen. The vital thing, though, to be able to keep the leadership on the straight and narrow and focused in the direction they're supposed to go to, towards is the activity of the rank and file membership. And so the best trade unions, I speak about trade and Tobago, the best trade unions are the trade unions that have the most democratic processes inside the unions, that have the greatest amount of accountability and so on and so on and so on. Um, and if you do that, and so I, I could only speak about the Office Workers Trade Union where I was for 40 years, I'm not trying to big up the union because I was there, but there is an ongoing constant process of renewal, of having young people coming forward for leadership, of educating and training the second rank, many of whom have gone up. So all the executive officers of the union today, Anson Roger, I trained all of them when I was head of the education department, and so on, ensuring there was succession planning. So. The trade union membership have to be active in the affairs of their union to make sure the union leadership doesn't go astray. And that goes for all institutions. The party will be as strong, not as Brother Philip Peer or your chairman or Alva and so on. The party is as strong as the membership. And we therefore all have to take responsibility which is part of the shifting of the consciousness that is necessary to bring us to a new stage of development in our society. We have to take a, have a responsibility now, a, sorry, a consciousness of taking responsibility and not just saying it's them people who have us so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brother David Abdullah. My comrade Alva Baptist will say we are navigating well and we are getting ready for, what's it? On final approach. <laughs> we are on final approach <laughs> in his navigation <laughs> jargon. Um, let me, before I call on the political leader of the San Lucia Labour Party to bring um, proceedings to, to, to a close, let me thank you. I think it was a, a really nice two and a half hours. What do you think? A really nice two and a half hours. In a very special way, I wish to say how I appreciated those who were here on time. When it was 7.30, many of you sat in the chairs and that was really nice to see. And I really love the way we cooperated with the questioning and the discussions and so on. I know there are many of you who have so many questions, but I know you understand 
but we wanted to keep this really tight and and we didn't want to bore anybody we wanted to ensure that you leave here within reasonable time so thank you very much that's just my own behalf but i want at this stage to call on the political leader of the saint lucia labor party honorable philip g pierre to bring the session to a close thank you very much mr chairman let me recognize the head table and my friend david abdullah see Dr. Kenny Anton in the audience, and I also see the son of Sir George F. L. Charles, but the Errol Charles, and his wife, you recognize him, please. <clears throat> I want also to apologize for not being here for the entire proceedings. I <clears throat> today was a, a, a very busy day for me. I had two other engagements. This one was more important, but I had to go to, to the other two. I guess I hope you can understand that. I want to thank David for, for coming over. I, had, I listened to some of his speech driving, using the uh, technology that he's speaking about, and I'm sure that we learned a lot. And we learned a lot from what he said, and we learned a lot for our party. Our party cannot be ashamed of being a party that was rooted in the trade union movement. <clears throat> Our party must be proud of its founder. Our party must be proud of Sir George F. L. Charles. Our party must be proud of all its leaders. Our party must be proud of what we've done for the working class of St. Lucia. We cannot be ashamed of that. We cannot hide from it. We've done many things for the the, the people of St. Lucia, particularly the working class. And I, and I heard David speak about being able to get people into trade unions. I want to tell him that in St. Lucia, and I think Dr. Anthony could probably say it better than me, in St. Lucia we've made the process extremely easy to become a member of trade unions because of the work of the St. Lucia Labour Party. <clears throat> I want to thank you all for coming here. I want to tell you that this is, one of the, this is just one of the engagements that we will have with you. I also want to tell you that our party is, <clears throat> is embarking on a values and principles conference and we'll be going to all constituencies to find out really what, is, what values you want to instill in the people of St. Lucia and the principles that which will guide our party when in government. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, and do have a good evening. <clears throat> This very moment is a sign that you didn't have enough because the comrade has brought the proceedings to a close. I wish you, I wish you safe travels. I wish you safe travels and please join us again um, at another activity, at, at the other, at the other activity of the St. Lucia Labour Party. I thank you very much. Looks like I have to say it again. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> thank you. Happy Labor